church. I want to speak to you tonight about the church. So if you have a copy of God's Word, if you turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, please. 1 Timothy chapter 3 tonight. And uh, again, we're uh, thankful for a thing, an institution, an organism called the church. And uh, again, I think we understand some things about the church that not, now, I don't know, it's not a secret. I think some people are just don't, don't really want to understand it. But I, I, I do think that there's some truth that I, we as uh, independent Baptists hold about the, the church that is uh, truth that is found in the Word of God, which others, I think, have some respects have just ignored. And uh, so tonight I want to speak to you why the church is critical, why the church is critical. And uh, we're going to do that here from this particular passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, our text is verses 15 and 16, but we'll begin in verse number 14. If you're able to stand, would you stand for just a moment, please, as we read this passage of Scripture? I'll read it, make a few comments and pray, and then you may be seated, and we'll get into preaching tonight. And uh, again, we're grateful for the privilege to, uh, again, open the Word of God. The Bible says in verse number 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So let me just help you understand that Paul is writing to a young man by the name of Timothy who... In many respects, Timothy, whether he was saved directly under Paul's ministry, was certainly saved as a result of Paul's ministry. Uh, many people believe that Paul, uh, you know, Paul was preaching when this young man came to faith in Christ. It was during his second missionary journey that Paul uh, called Timothy to travel with him in the ministry. So in many respects, he mentors this young man, trains him for the ministry. And so in those days, there weren't Bible colleges. And so the training was done and, you know, with hands-on. And so Timothy was a young man getting trained by an older preacher by the name of Paul. And, of course, Paul has sent him, specifically, most scholars believe that uh, Timothy is in a place called Ephesus, a church that Paul planted. And Paul sent him here, there to help that church and its church plan and its work. And so he's saying to this young man, as you can read, obviously, for yourself, he's saying, I'm hoping to come to you. I've sent you there, and I'm hoping to show up there shortly. Notice what he says in verse 15. But... But what, if I tarry long, if I don't get there as soon as I think, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory." I want us to look, if you would, in verse number 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I think, just by that verse alone, that I'd say that what the church is given to do is critical, vitally important. Uh, it doesn't take backseat to any other organization or organism or any institution. It is primary and it needs to be primary in our life. So I want to speak to you tonight for a few moments on the time that's allotted to us tonight on this idea that the church, the church is critical. Would you pray with me and ask the Lord to help us with this? Father, we thank you for this evening and this meeting of the church. We don't take it lightly, Lord, when this church meets to conduct a ministry and a service. Lord, it is our desire that what we do here as a congregation would be pleasing the sight of Almighty God. Because it isn't my church, and it isn't the church of these people, although we belong to it. It is your church. And so, Father, tonight as we speak on this vitally important subject, I pray, Father, that you give us wisdom, give us understanding. Lord, help the folks to receive your truth. Help me to share with them, Lord, nothing new. There's nothing new here. It's just a reminder of some things we probably already know, but things I think that we need to be reminded of in this day and age in which we're living. So, Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. So, those of us who have been around for a while, and maybe you've, you've heard, and maybe you've done a little study in what we know as church history, it'd be no secret to us to say this, that the church has always had, in a sense, it's always been under attack. Jesus made the statement in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18, when he's speaking to Peter and to his apostles and to his disciples, He'd spe uh, specifically taken them to this place called Caesarea Philippi. I preached on this not too, much, too long ago on a Sunday morning about the church and, and its, its foundation. But he says to Peter here in this particular chapter, he said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now again, I remind you that Jesus wasn't saying he was building his church on Peter. 
there's a, an understanding that you have to have when he says, uh, thou art Peter, that's a, he, in the Greek language, that's a small stone. And he said, upon this rock, this massive rock, not a small stone, but a massive rock, will I build my church. So it's impossible to say that he was building his church on Peter because he said, you're a small stone. Later on, Peter understood that. He said, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just one of the living stones in the building. So he was saying, he was saying Peter, you just confessed that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, I'm telling you, that's how my church is built. As people come to the understanding that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one that can save them. People get saved, they get baptized, and they're added to a congregation, and God builds his church, or his church is. And so when he said that, he goes on to make this statement in verse number 18, and he says, uh, and upon this rock I will build my church, and listen, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now from the wording that Christ uses, the church is to be a moving in this world. See, gates don't move. Gates are stationary. Uh, you may pick up a gate and move it, but the truth of the matter is gates are made to be stationary. And so when he says, hey, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, it means the church is on the move. And it's coming against the gates of hell, and the gates of hell cannot hold back the church as God has given it its primary responsibility. So what does that mean? It means that the church in this world is to be in this world and proclaiming a message. Think, think about this. Not just inside the four walls of a meeting place, but literally the message that God has given to us as the church, as his people, is to be shared publicly and from person to person. That's why we believe in you taking tracks, gospel tracks. That's why we encourage you to be a witness where God places you. That's why we have organized outreaches together as a congregation so we can go out into the community, not just say inside the four walls. We're, we're not some secret society here. It's always troubled me, these buildings that are built and they have no windows. I'm thinking, what are you trying to hide? I mean, we're not trying to hide anything, but we're not just hide inside this building. The Bible says that we're to go out into the community. We're to take the message out into the community. So certainly that's the pattern that we find in the New Testament, whether it's in the Gospels, Acts, or the Epistles. It's about the church proclaiming truth in the public venue. Now, the, from the church's founding, the world has resisted its message. So if we truly believe that Jesus was the founder of the first church, and I'm a firm believer of that, I believe he was the founder and the first pastor of the first church. If you understand what a church is, it's a called out assembly. So what did he do? He began to call out apostles, didn't he? He said, come and follow me. That's the foundation of the church. And he begins a church, and he's the first pastor of this particular church. And, and as we think about that, as he's the founder, we can see uh, that there was resistance to the message that Jesus proclaimed his, as he proclaims his truth in the world. Again, some of the public may have said, hey, this is a good message, we like it. But quite honestly, he felt resistance from the religious leadership. So after Jesus left, his disciples and apostles had the responsibility to, pro to propagate the truth of the gospel. We, we understand the Great Commission is not just given to men, but it's given to an institution called the church. So he said to the church, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So they were given that responsibility. So when people believed then they were given responsibility not only to preach the gospel, but then to baptize them. And then he said, then I want you to train them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and law I'm with you all in the state of the world. So what were they to teach them? They were to teach them this New Testament doctrine. So we have a pattern. Salvation, baptism, training. Salvation, baptism, training. So that first church that Jesus started expanded and exploded in Jerusalem. Yet, think about this, as we study the book of Acts, we understand they face stiff opposition and persecution to their message. I, I'm, I'm telling you, go in the early part of Acts, and we find that they face uh, Saul of Tarsus and his viciousness against it. So we, we read about this Saul of Tarsus that made, the Bible uses the word havoc of the church. And that word havoc is like a dog who grabs a hold of something, you know, like a pit bull. Well, most of us would understand that sometimes these pit bulls can be vicious animals. I've had people who say, well, they're not really vicious. Well, I don't want to mess around with it, just be honest with you. If somebody's got a pit bull in their backyard, I don't know that pit bull, he doesn't know me. Believe me, I don't care if they say he's friendly, I'm going to be real cautious, all right? Because I know what that, that those dogs are capable of, and, and I know how they can grab a hold of something and not want to let it go. And so when the Bible uses the word havoc, it's like a rabid dog getting a hold of something and just shaking it. So when the Bible says he made havoc of the church, that's what it means, so Saul of Tarsus made havoc of the church, and the members of the church, think about this, some of them died, they were terrorized, they were abused, and they were jailed. Yet the church doesn't diminish, does it? 
I love that. I love the fact that though he made havoc of the church and while he brought persecution against the church, it didn't diminish. He continues to expand. The members of the church were faithful to their Lord and their calling. So the church becomes churches. It goes from being one church to pl- plurality of churches and the persecution d- doesn't decide. It's, it doesn't subside. It seems that each church has its measure of persecution. Paul, speaking to the elders in Acts chapter 20, spoke to the fact that at, to the elders at the church at Ephesus, the, the very church to whom he sent Timothy, he said, I want you to know that, hey, there's coming to come persecution. You're going to face it in the future, and some of it's going to even rise among you. If you want to turn over to Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, hold your place here. We're coming back to the book of Timothy in just a moment. But Acts chapter 20, and I want you to notice, if you would, verse uh, 29 and 30 through 31. I want you to notice what Paul writes there. He says, for this, for I know this, that after my departing, so it had been revealed to Paul. Of course, Paul was a prophet and preacher. He saw things in the future. He's forecasting. He said, for I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Notice, please, not sparing the flock. So he said, I I want you to know that, hey, into the church are going to come these wolves. Not sparing the flock, also of your own selves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. So what's Paul saying? He's saying, hey, hey, even the church at Ephesus, even this New Testament era, even as the church is expanding and and, and making progress in gaining ground against the gates of hell, they're going to continue to face persecution. So if we trace biblical churches through time, you'll find that the church almost always has faced difficulty because of the message that they hold to. So think about this. Let, let's face it. When we look at our culture, the message of, of the church and the message of the Bible aren't exactly popular in our culture today, are they? It's pretty amazing what's happening in our culture. I say amazing. I should maybe use the word disturbing. I'm disturbed by it. Disturbed by what I'm seeing happening in, the, in our culture. So when we think about the world system, it's doing everything within its Everything within its power to, think about this, to invalidate, to intimidate, and to silence the church from having a voice in the public square. When, when, I, when I think about that, so listen to what I just said. I said it's doing everything within its power to invalidate, to intimidate, and to silence us. So when you look out there and you see this landscape that's being stirred and you're seeing this, this uprising against Christianity and about Bible belief and, and Christians being marginalized and Christians being kind of shoved to the shoulder and, and, and said, hey, we don't want to hear from you. Your, 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 voice, is not, your voice is not appreciated. I, I think you probably some of you that are in social media perhaps seen this recently, but there was a, uh, over in Pennsylvania, a, uh, I would say probably an evangelical who's a member of their, uh, of their um, uh, state house, a representative, she got up and I mean she prayed a pretty powerful prayer in the name of Jesus. Well, she offended half the Democrats and she offended uh, the Muslims that were par- in that particular house and because she prayed in Jesus' name. Can you imagine praying in the name of Jesus in the United States of America is offensive? But I'm just simply saying that is what's happening in our culture. There's this pushback, this shove back against us and our message. Now, now here's what I want you to understand. I take courage tonight. I take, I'm encouraged tonight when I think about what Jesus said when he said, hey, The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. We have a more powerful message, and it doesn't matter if they're trying to marginalize us. It doesn't matter if they're trying to invalidate us. It doesn't matter if they're trying to silence us. That can't work if we're doing what God wants us to do. Now, that's encouraging to me. If we're following God's plan, what the world throws at us can't stop us. Now, tonight I want us to look at Paul's message here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And and I want you to look at these two verses, and I want you to notice it speaks to us about this critical, this church as being critical. So I'm just going to give you two major thoughts tonight. I know you love that, don't you, when I say, hey, now instead of three points, not four points, we got two points tonight. But I didn't tell you how long those two points is going to be, all right? So, so, so understand that we're just going to deal with two major points tonight. Notice, number one, the church is critical because it is literally the house of God. It is literally the house of God. Now notice what his instructions are in verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God. So notice his instructions. Hey, hey, Timothy, you're a young preacher. I've sent you over here to to Ephesus, a church that I helped start and plant, a church that is growing, a church that needs some help. I've written an epistle to them. 
but I'm sending you over there to help that church. But in case I don't get there, I want you to know, uh, I'm, gonna give you, I'm writing this book to you to help you in your, in your ministry here among those people because what happens in this church is vital because it is the church of, of the living God, but it is, the, it is the house of God. He said literally in verse number 15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest be, knowest how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So Paul is sharing with him truth that would help this church and, and churches in the future. So if this, we, we believe that what we're reading here, though it is 2,000 years old, was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Though it was written to a particular church, it certainly is applicable to us tonight. So here's what I mean. Notice Paul tells him of the critical nature of the church. It's important to point out that we're talking about a local congregation. See, this is what many pe people move, lose tonight because we're living in this generation when many people don't think of a church as being local. Oh, oh yeah, there can be a congregation local, but it's not necessarily the church. It's just part of the church. D did you know that really that's Catholic doctrine? See, Catholics believe in one church, a universal church. They're it. And, and instead of churches being churches, they are, they are parishes. They're part of the mother. You know, They're part of this big conglomerate. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches local assemblies. Now here recently, you know, I've been gone a lot preaching. Uh, in, in the last three weeks, I was in a church that ran about 150 on Sunday morning. Then I was with Brother Dan Novi, a church that is just kind of really a restart, running about 50 on Sunday morning. And then last week I preached at Lancaster Baptist Church, probably a church running about 3,500. Now, we may say, well, that big church, that's a church. You know, because it's big. You know, they got all kinds of ministries. They got buses and people going every place. They have a 200-voice choir, big orchestra. I, I mean, it, it, they got stuff going on all the time. That's a church. No more so than this upstart church that's just getting started. Brother Novi's church being replanted. That's a church as well. You see, we have to see it that way. It is, it is a church. And God placed it there, and, and as a result of that, we're, we're talking about it. And so in the mind of God, a local con congregation that is formed properly, no matter what size it is, no matter if it's 60, almost 61 years old, like the Cleveland Baptist Church, or a church that was planted last week, but is, has come together and is standing and, and saying, we're trying to be an autonomous church, trying to reach our community. We have hold the New Testament doctrine. We've been planted properly out of another church. I'm here to tell you, they're as much of a church as we're a church. In the mind of God, they're a church just like we're a church. And we have to see it that way. It's critical. So what does that mean? Well, notice that we are the house of God, according to verse number 15. So when we think about the house, I, I read to you from Ephesians, again, a church where Timothy was, that Paul wrote to that church in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, in whom all the building fitly framed together growth unto a temple, holy temple in the Lord, in whom also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now let me read that again because I want you to listen in the context of which we're speaking. So Paul wrote to Timothy and said, hey, I want you to know, hey, you're gonna, you, know, you know how to behave yourself in the church, which is the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So then he writes to Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus, and he says, in whom all the buildings, speaking of the church, fitly framed together, growth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also ye are builded together for a habitation of God through a spirit. So what does that mean? Well, the local congregation is the house or the dwelling place of God in this world. Amen. So we understand that God inhabits heaven. Don't we? I mean, we understand there's a God in heaven. I read in the book of Revelation that he's got a throne there and, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. But that being stated, I'm here to tell you that God, you, you can't get out of the presence of God. Amen. But when I think about the church, when I think about the dwelling place, God doesn't, doesn't live in a building. However, when we meet together as a church, as a congregation, as a church, God moves in among us. Amen. That's the thought. That when the church meets, God moves in among us. In other words, God is here. Now, you say, well, I don't see him. You're not going to see him. But I want you to sense him. I want you to believe what he says. He's saying, hey, it's Sunday night. It's March the 31st. And it's stinking cold outside. And we got snow today. But I'm here to tell you that I'm here. And, and I'm, I'm doing my work. And I'm, I'm among you. And we need to see it that way. We need to see that this is a, a habitation. When we come together as a church, it is a habitation for God. Now, uh, 
I think we all know that where a person lives is, is a special place. So the home that Denise and I dwell in, is it, it's special to me. It's our home. I, I travel a lot. I'm getting ready to travel a whole lot more. And, and so sometimes I find myself in different places. And, and I, I, I've, I've slept in many a hotel room. I, I've slept in, in, in what we call prophet's chambers that churches have put in place so that when a guest preacher comes, they have a place to, to stay. I, I've stayed in guest rooms. I, I, I've been in a lot of places. Now, i got to just tell you, I'm, I'm not planning on staying in those places. I, that's not where I'm going to live. I may be there for a few days, I'm visiting, but I'm gonna go home. I wanna be in my home. It's special to me. There's no place, there's, look, look, there is no bed in this world like my bed. There's no table in this world like my table. There's no food in this world like the, the food my wife cooks. I'm, I'm just telling you. Uh, and so there is no place like home. It's special to us. And so I, I, I care about them. When I stay in, another, in places where people put me, I'm not some slob. I, I don't leave the room when I, when I pack up and leave and, and I'm heading to an airport. I don't leave stuff all over the room and, and, and you know, trash here and there. Uh, why? I'm a guest. But I'm telling you, that, that place may be a place I'm going to stay in. I'm not going to treat it wrong. But I, I'm telling you, there's something about home. There's something about the place where I live. I care about my house. Recently, I was in Washington, D.C. for the Capital Connection, and I think I mentioned to you that I had an opportunity, a privilege, to be about, uh, with about 20 preachers. We had a, an invitation to attend a meeting in the Eisenhower office building on the property and the grounds of the, uh, of the White House complex. And, and uh, when we were done with that meeting, we walked down the, the Navy steps that are on the I guess it would be on the east side. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to get my geography right. I think on the east side of that Eisenhower building. And as we walked down the steps, right in front of us was what we call the west wing of the White House. There's an entrance into the west wing. And of course, we know where the west wing is where the president does his business. The, we know the president lives in the White House. He dwells there. That's his place for four years while he's president. And, and so instead of leaving his home, he just comes downstairs and goes to work. And so I was just standing outside of that. But, but I want you to know that that's a special place. That, that, that place called the White House is a special place. Did, did you know prior to the meeting that I went to that I had to submit information so I had to go through a, a, a security clearance? So in other words, I had to send them information. My, my, my birthday, I think my social security number, they, they need to do a background check on me because they don't want just anybody walking onto their property. And then when I got there, even though I had submitted to that and I'd been approved to go in, when I got there, I had to show ID that I was who I said I was. And then they didn't just take that for granted. You know what they did? They, they, they made me empty my pockets and put all that stuff through a, an x-ray machine. And then I had to walk through, I, I had to walk through a, 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 one of those stand-up metal detectors. And then they still, after that, waved a wand over me. And then when I was done with that, guess what? I couldn't just roam wherever I wanted to. No, no, I had to be with our group and I couldn't get out of sight. I had to be where I was supposed to be. So... Why, why do I say that? They treated that property with the utmost respect. The people working there looked sharp. They understood that what went on in that house, listen, was critical. Amen. They looked upon their mission as being important. I, I'm telling you that I, 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 I'm just, I'm thinking to myself that, you know, we can learn something. Because if the world thinks what they do is important, Hey, church, we got much more important things to do. And we must see it that way. We must see it as critical. I want you to know the God of heaven has promised to meet with us here tonight in this church house. He's here tonight. We should be aware of his presence. Are you? When you walked in the door tonight, you say, oh, there's my friend over there. Hey, hey there's Joe. There's Sally. Oh, there's people I've known for years. And I'm glad you know them. I'm glad you have fellowship but did we even, aren't we even conscious tonight that God said he's here? Do we have a cognizance of his presence in this place tonight? And he said, I want you to know that the church is critical because it's the house of God. It's where I dwell, even if we can't see him. It's also, notice it's identified in this verse, not only the house of God, but it's the church of the living God. I, I, I said this this morning, I'm glad my God isn't dead. He isn't distracted. He isn't disengaged. He's very much engaged in what's going on in this world, and he is very much attentive to what goes on in his house, the church house, 
here at the, at the Cleveland Baptist Church. So we said it's the house of living on letter B. It's the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Paul, speaking to another local congregation, says, now are ye. I'm going to time out for just a moment. I've said this before. I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize this throughout the, the service tonight. But the, in the English language, specifically in the Old English, we have a differentiation in what we call pronouns. So when we think about pronouns and you're reading your Bible, anytime you see a pronoun of you or ye, it is speaking to the group. It's speaking to the church, specifically to that church. And so when he says, now are ye, uh, the body of Christ, and members in particular, he's saying to that church in Corinth, I want you to know something, not only the house of God, but I want you to know that you are also the body of Christ in that location. Romans chapter 12, verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. So he's saying, hey, collectively, when we, when we get together as a church, we are the body of Christ, though we're separate one from the other. The New Testament church, no matter what location it is in, is the body of Christ. In other words, what we do as a congregation, as the members of this church, is to, if we want to know what our mission is, let's do what Jesus would do if he were here. We're to carry out his mission. We're to carry out his function. We're to be his, his extension. We're to be his body. Our hands are his hands. Our, our, our mind is his mind. Our, our focus is to be his focus. I think it's critical that when a church meets, that all of its members are present. I understand there are times when people are incapacitated and can't be here. I, I understand there are times when folks are out of town or, or away in business. I met a man this morning who is being relocated here to Cleveland, was in our service this morning, and, and, and he shared with me that he's vitally involved in his church at home. He's hoping to fly home on weekends, maybe attend here on Wednesdays, but you know, I just simply say you know, there are times when your business may take you someplace else and you can't necessarily be present with your, with your body, but the truth of the matter is, is that uh, when we think about that, uh, we, if we're able to attend and then we don't, we're saying what is happening here isn't all that important. It's not important if I show up. Now, I don't know about you, but when I got up this morning, I wanted all my body to get up. I didn't want to leave part of my body laying in the bed. I, when I got up, I wanted my legs to function. I wanted my hands to function. I wanted, I wanted my, my eyes to function, my mind to function. And so as, as I think about that, I, I wanted that to happen. I was working on Friday, and I wrote this down. It says, as I'm working and putting this message together in my office and using my mind. I'm using my mind. I'm using my eyes to read and to study. I, I'm using my hands to record notes for the delivery of this message. I need all my body in order for it to function. I wouldn't be happy, and I don't think you'd be happy if I only half showed up here tonight. You only, I wish that maybe, I, I kind of wish I was kind of half of the man that I am. Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that I want all my body to be here. I want my mind to be here. I want my eyes to be here. I want my hands to be here. I, I don't want my, I don't want to be left half of myself at home tonight. I don't want to be here because my body is necessary. So, we think about the church being a body, and so it's important that when the church meets, we meet, and we're here to be a part of the body. Then, then I want you to notice it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we said we're the house of God. We said we're the body of Christ. But did you know we're also the temple of the Holy Spirit? I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're coming back to 1 Timothy, so hold your place. I want you to look at verses 16 and 17. I'm going to help you understand something here tonight. Hopefully, this is not a new truth. I just want you to see it, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye, ye, there again, there's that plural pronoun, right? So he's speaking to the collective group. He said, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man devile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now time out. I preached this morning from 1 Corinthians 15, but we walked through the passage. We, we walked from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 15. If you were here, you remember that message. And I shared with you that church was going through some problems, and Paul wasn't being hateful. He wasn't being mean. He wasn't being spiteful. He was trying to help that church to really get a hold of what was really wrong with them. And part of what was wrong with them was that they didn't understand the significance of the person that they were worshiping. But isn't it interesting in chapter 3, as he's nailing down some things that are wrong with the church, that he's saying, you didn't understand, church, that you as a church 
are the body or the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the house of God, you're the body of Christ, but you're also the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you defile that temple, it's not a good thing. Now, here's, the, here's what we've always done. We've, we've all done this, and there's nothing wrong with it. We say, hey, when the Bible says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, we, we, we talk about ourselves. The Holy Spirit of God lives in us. And, and certainly, you go to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God till the day of, till the day of redemption. You, you are sealed. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. That is, that is biblical. Amen. So there is a sense in which you individually are, have the, the Spirit of God inside of you. But I think what he's saying to this church is, you better be careful. You better be careful what you do in the church house. Because you defile my body, it's where my spirit dwells. You bring division unnecessarily into the church. You bring fornication into the church. You bring immorality in my church. He said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to deal with you. Because it's my house. I've said this before. You don't come into my house uninvited. I'm telling you, nobody better come into my house in the middle of the night because I'm telling you, it will not be good. It will not be pretty. Why? It's my house. You're, you're not coming in. And I don't expect when I invite people into my house to mess up my house. I don't expect them to trash my house or mess up my house. I expect them to respect my house. And when I invite people in, I don't expect them to divide my family against me. And I'm simply saying, when Paul says, hey, the church is critical, you understand that the church is critical. And it is the temple of, of God. It's the, it's the house of God. It's the body of Christ. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you mess with it, look out. Dangerous stuff. Because it's my house, he says. And it's my body and it's my temple. So that brings me to my second main point, And we'll do this quickly. The church is critical because of its purpose in the world. So he says in verse number 15 of chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now here it is. Here's the purpose, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. And then I think that takes us into verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the spirit, justified, I'm sorry, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, there's some things that are critically important because of what they do. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I am grateful that I'm not, I'm, I guess sometimes, maybe like today, that I'm not necessarily grateful that Lake Erie is right here because we get what's known as lake effect. But I am grateful to live on a great lake. I'm grateful for Lake Erie because when I turn on my spigot at home, water comes out. Amen. And I have to tell you that in, anytime you're going to have life, anytime you're going to have vitality, you have to have water. Amen. And we are, we are placed on one of the great lakes and we are a source, our, our source of water is Lake Erie. And so it is critical. I, I think our protection of that lake, what we do with that lake is vitally important because I don't know about you, but I want to drink pure water. Now, some of you may have, have, a, have a dispute with that and say, well, I don't think the water coming out of my tap is so good, but I've been drinking it for years. Look at me. Look how good I look, right? <laughs> so I'm just simply saying that, you know, we, we look at that water as being a, a clean source of, of good water. It's critical. It's critical because of what it does. Um, how many of you are like me? Um, you want to live in a world with, with good laws, with good people to enforce them. I, I don't want to live in a world that doesn't have good laws, and I don't want to live someplace where people don't enforce them. I, I feel like we're living in a time when our law enforcement is saying, uh, you know, we, we're trying, but it's not working so good. How many of you folks are like me? You, you're driving down 40, and then some, I'll use the word numbskull, <laughs> comes flying by you about 90 miles an hour. And I'm glad at that moment there are laws. Because here's what I want you to know. While that one person may say, well, I, I don't have to obey this law, I'm glad that there are other people that are obeying at that moment. I'm glad that there's a speed limit. And, and, and I'm glad that every once in a while when I'm on 480, I see police. Sometimes those numbskulls that come flying by me, I see them up the road. They're pulled over to the side with the red lights going on, you know. 
And, and I'm glad at that moment that, that there is law enforcement. I'm not always glad when that happens in my life, but, but, but I'm, I'm just simply saying I'm, I'm glad I live in a world where there's law enforcement and, and laws, and, and so it, it's critically important. Now, notice that, that what it says here about the church. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, the Paul, Paul, of course, is this great apostle, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he calls the church the pillar and ground of the truth. So, again, I'm not all that familiar with the buildings of the ancient world, although I have just recently been in Israel, and one of the things I see is a lot of these columns or these pillars that are found in almost every place where there are ancient ruins. So, evidently, pillars were vitally important in the day in which Paul lived for buildings, we are living, we are in a building and, and we have, um, uh, I guess we call these trusses, we call these, uh, uh, that, that really basically are really the, the, the skeleton of this building. And one of the reasons we can stay in here tonight and not have snow on top of us is because we have a roof and we couldn't have a roof unless we had pillars or we had these, these trusses to hold the roof up. So when we think about the building, when we think about what a building does, in order for a building to function, it, it has to be able to stand. So what, what Paul is saying is I want you to understand that the, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And, and so uh, for a pillar to stand, think about this, that pillars were critical to, to the superstructure of the building. They held it together, allowed it to stand. But of course the pillar in order to stand had to have, be erected on solid ground. Amen. You didn't just put a pillar on the ground outside. You, you, had to, you had to, many times what they do, if they couldn't find stone, they would go unearth some stone. Do you remember when they erected the temple and they, got, they, they, they quarried all that stone and brought it onto the property of the temple? It's interesting that they put all that stone in place, but you know, they never heard a hammer striking there. Uh, all that, that, that temple was put together. It was engineered prior to getting there, and they just assembled it. But they had all this rock, and that rock, uh, no doubt they had to dig down. We were just in Israel. One of the fascinating things is to go under what we call the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall there in Israel. There are, are tours that take you down underneath the, the Dome of the Rock, the, the, where the, the temple stood. I'm telling you, it's fascinating to see those walls. Some of those things date back to the days of Solomon. They're still there. Why? Because they, they dug down deep enough, they planted, they're big enough that that, that whole superstructure was held up by, by pillars and by, by ground, by something that was solid. So... Think about this. The church is to be the pillar and ground of truth. Not just any truth, but God's truth. So what's he saying? Well, the church is to take God's truth. So this, this is the message tonight. You can't miss this. The church is to take God's truth. We're to, we're, we're to hold God's truth up in this world because the church has a foundation to stand upon. We have, we have the ability to hold that up, and the world needs to see God's truth. Now, now don't miss this because it's important. So whether the world accepts it or believes it, everything that God says and everything that his word teaches is truth. I want to say that again. Whether the world accepts it, whether they believe it or not, everything that God says is truth. The world may think it's narrow and obsolete to believe that there's only one way to God for spiritual salvation, and that is through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, and through repentance and faith in Christ. That's the only way of salvation. The world says that's narrow, but God says that's the truth. The unsaved world may think there's no such thing as heaven and hell, but the word of God states that human beings as we are are sinners, and as a result of that, our sin demands a payment, and that's, that, that payment ultimately is separation from God in a place called hell. But God wants us not to go to hell, but he wants us to go to heaven, and so he's provided salvation for us, and so both heaven and hell are declared in the Bible as being truth. The world may believe that two people can cohabitate, that it isn't wrong or immoral, but that's not what God says. The world may think in this age of enlightenment that, that more than two gen, there are more than two genders and there's, that gender isn't necessarily a, a sign at birth or it's fluid. I'm telling you, I, I cannot believe how foolish we have become. A boy is not a boy based upon his chromosomes and his anatomy. Because he could be a girl stuck in a boy's body. I'm telling you, we are, we are becoming ridiculously foolish. Declaring themselves to be wise, they became fools. And so while the world may say, well, that's not necessarily so, God says, look, I made them in the beginning. I made them male and female. You don't move. You are one or the other. That's what God says. That's his truth. The world may think in this age of enlightenment that it's, 
that they're good with homosexual relationship, but that isn't what God states. He calls these relationships an abomination. So I'm just simply saying, God doesn't just single out one particular sin or one particular thing. He he, he says, look, I'm going to tell you what the truth is. And so as a response to that, the church is to hold that up. So we who are saved, who are part of a good church, we're, we're part of holding this truth up in this world. So that brings me to my final thought here tonight. The church... It's so critical because it's the guardian of the most important message ever shared. Look at verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Would you notice that Jesus here is called God? It's no question. He said God was, 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 what does he say? God God was manifest in the flesh. God came down and lived among us. So this is a very concise, think about this, a very concise but important truth. The the word mystery here is not something that is hard to understand. Basically, it's just something that had not been known previously. Or had just, God had brought it to light so that folks could understand it. So when we think about the mystery of godliness, the prophets prophesied about the virgin birth. They, They prophesied about the coming of Christ, but they didn't really understand it. It was a kind of a mystery to them. But we get to the New Testament era, and we understand the virgin birth because it's proclaimed for us. We understand about the, the, the coming of Christ and what his purpose is because we're able to see it. So that which was a mystery before, that which was kind of mysterious or not necessarily understood, now has become light. Amen. And so he said, I want you to tell you that this is, the, this is important for us to understand. So this statement in verse 16 speaks to the work of Jesus, God, of God in the flesh. And the church is given a responsibility, think about this, of, of sharing that message in this world. It's critical. I'm going to give you three applications and I'm done. What the church is given to do is vitally important. So I don't want you to think about your church as just being a place where you show up. I don't want you to say, so it's a good church. I've been a part of it for a while. No, no, you need to think of, of the church, whether it's this church or any other church that is, a, quote, a legitimate church, a New Testament church. You need to think of it at, at what happens here, what we do here, what we've been given to do here is critical not just for this moment, but in the days to come. Amen. Not just because we have a history, but because we have a future. Yeah. While we wait for Jesus, we have a, a work to do. And so what we, God has given us to do is critical. That brings me to my second thought. How we conduct ministry and go about presenting this truth is critical. So if, we, if, our, if our ministry is critical, what God has given us to do is critical, then how we conduct that is, is critical. Now think about it. It isn't just the message that's important. It's the messenger too. It's the messenger too. It seems that to me that in some respects in, in, we may be losing in our, our world tonight, we are losing what I call character and credibility and integrity when it comes to messengers. You and I are part of a, a church. If we're saved, we're baptized, we're part of this church. We said this is the, this is the house of God. It's the, it, it is the church of the living God. It is the body of Christ. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if that's the case, then I'm a part of this, then what I do and how I do it and how I live is is vitally important. Not just when I come to church. Not just the kind of ministry that we have here, but what we do outside of the church is critical as well. So when we say that, hey, God has given us the truth, we're to hold up the truth. Let me ask you this question. How many of us think that the world, the unsaved world, is, is just dying to get in the Bible? No, no, I just shared with you, they're, they're really repudiating it tonight. They're, they're really pushing back against it. You, you know one of the reasons they're pushing back against it? Because the church has been failing. We have not held up the truth the way we should. We have not had credibility in our lives. We, we have lacked integrity sometimes in our living. And, and as a result, of the work, world looks at us and says, you're preaching to us, you're no different than we are. Your marriages fail in the same way our marriages fail. You, you talk to us about integrity, and some of you don't pay your bills. Some of you are, are, are negligent in, in the conduct of your business. You're, you're not carrying out uh, ministry in a way that has integrity. I'm telling you, just recently there was an expose. It was down in the Houston Chronicle. It was also in another newspaper about immorality in churches. And it's a shame. It is a shame what has gone, gone on in the name of God in churches. And how many people have been hurt 
And the world looks at us, and it's no wonder that we can't make an impact on the world because of our lack of integrity in our living and our behavior. And I'm telling you that one of the reasons that we're failing in this world is because we are not the people we should be. We want people to look at us, well, don't they look nice? Oh, they're dressed up. They must have went to church. I would much rather a person not wear a tie to church and live with integrity in the world than somebody come into church and have the nicest suit on and live, go outside the doors of the church and say they're a member of the church and live like the devil and bring a bad name to the church and live in a way that's a reproachful. I would much rather that be the case. Hey, come in your blue jeans. Come in your T-shirt. I, I don't care. Just be right. Just live right. Just do right. The old preacher Bob Jones used to say, do right. Do right till the stars fall out of heaven. Do right. I'm here to tell you it's hard sometimes to do right. It's so easy to do wrong, but we need to do right in this world. I don't care how hard it is. May God help us to have marriages that last. And may we, may, may we preach that. May God help us to have integrity in our business dealings and, and the way that we conduct business. May, may we be honest and may we be people that are upright. What we see, may, may it be what people get. I'm just simply saying, how can we impact the world? If what we have to deal with is critical, then the messenger is just as critical as the message. And finally, how we treat the church states whether we think what we do here is important or not. Let me say that again. How we treat the church states whether we think what we do here is important or not. I don't think many of you would be really happy with me tonight if I got up and said, you know, folks, I haven't had a lot of time to study this week. I'll give you a couple thoughts from the scripture and you can go home. Now, now that could happen, I suppose, at, at some point because of just things that have happened. Just, you know, But the truth of the matter is, one of the reasons people show up here on Sunday night, and they show up on Sunday morning, they even come in the midweek service, because they know that when somebody stands in this pulpit, they're not going to just give them something, or give them something from the Word of God that they've studied and prepared to get. If you weren't here Wednesday night, you heard a great message from a young man, Brother John Blankenship. He studied, prepared himself to deliver that message. It's a powerful message. Thank the Lord for it. But I'm just simply saying, you should expect that. So, if you expect that of me, why shouldn't we expect of you, if you're a choir member, that you would be here putting your all into the choir? Why wouldn't we expect some of you folks who are bus captains to be out on Saturday morning visiting your bus route? Now, you may not always be able to get out because of work, or maybe you've got a, something has come up, but I'm telling you, if you have a bus route, part of being having a bus route is visiting the bus route. If you're a Sunday school teacher here, you ought not to be up on Sunday, Sunday morning and say, well, I really haven't had much chance to get my, my Sunday school lesson together. Let me look at this thing and see if I can throw something together real quick. I'm just telling you that, hey, God expects more of us. And how we conduct ministry in the church says whether we think what we're doing here is critically important or not. So I'm just saying to you, I'm bearing my soul with you tonight as your pastor. I believe in the church. Not because I invented it, but because God invented it. I believe in the church because of what it's said here, that it is the church of the living God. It's the household of God. It's the body of Christ. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are the pillar and ground of the truth. God has given us the responsibility to hold up truth in a generation that doesn't want to hear it. But man, if they can see the credibility of it in our lives, there's something attractive about that. But if they look at us and we say, hey, we believe the truth, and yet they don't see the truth in us, <laughs> I don't want what you've got. Hey, I'm going to tell you, sooner or later, the world's going to fall apart. Sooner or later, people that you know, their lives are going to fall apart. And you know who they're going to be looking to? They're going to be looking to people whose lives are together because they know the truth. And maybe they've seen your life fall apart, but you haven't fallen apart because you know the truth. We're the church of the living God. What God does in his church is critical. Let's